Good morning, my friends, and a happy new year. I have been very busy in the last few weeks and yesterday and today as well, treating more and more cases with COVID. And I want to have everybody healthy and able to benefit from the vaccine because it looks like more and more people are sick and getting into the hospital and not doing well. And even some people are, <clears throat> you know, dying and this should not happen. So I just wanted to review with you the treatment methods that I use that are easy to use and that I've used successfully for quite a while. And now more people are realizing some of those easy ways to treat because I've uh, you know, tried a lot of different things that made sense and are starting to use it, but the dosages vary. And I see with uh, inappropriate dosages, lack of efficacy as well. So let's start with ivermectin. Ivermectin is extremely safe. It's safe even 10 times higher than the doses that were initially recommended when treating parasitic infections. The doses that were recommended for treating parasitic infections were 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. So you take your weight in pounds. If you're using pounds, divide by 2.2, and then you would multiply it by the amount that you want to give. So let's say you're weighing 120 pounds, let's say that comes out to 50 something kilos and you multiply that number by 0.2. Well, it is good, but it's not good enough. For treating coronavirus, I found that the best dosage to start with is 0.45 milligrams per kilogram. So day one, you take 0.45 milligram per kilogram. The other days you take 0.3 milligrams per kilogram for the remainder of about nine days. Now, why do I say not two, not three, not four, like I see some people, but 10 days? Everything has to make sense. And you have to understand the way the virus works and the way our body fights it. So the antibodies that are our humoral immunity, so the beginning fight when the virus first attacks us, we don't have antibodies to it. So the way we are fighting it is using our innate, our kind of standing army. But that standing army cannot recognize the virus because of the tricks that it uses. So we need to have the ivermectin to help us to allow our body to pronounce the alarm so that they will close the door of the cells that have not yet been infected. And that's why it's so important that the therapy is introduced as early as possible. And we're not going now into prophylaxis. That's a different topic. So you want to use it until the antibodies, the humoral immunity is developed. Now, how long does that take to develop? Usually about two weeks. You have the IgM and you at the beginning and then the IgG. So when you hear about the plasma, you hear about Regeneron using their antibodies, that's basically giving it to you if you don't have yet the body producing it. The problem is if you wait too long and you already have the cytokine storm, you have a lot of, you'd say, panic happening in the body. Well, we know what panic leads to, nothing good. And you have a lot of destruction and reduced in your ability to heal and cascade of different things where you have like a house of cards, things falling apart. Um, you know, now the hostels are aware of what to do, so it's a little easier, but there are still hostels that I find that don't do the stuff. I've treated people in Michigan, in other states, Texas, in um, Nevada. Um, I've treated people in Switzerland, in Ukraine, uh, so Moscow. So, so I, I, I'm seeing things uh, happening in different countries, and, and still not everybody is, is fully aware of the way to treat. So the duration, how long do you need to treat it and why? So the uh, ima imagine to yourself that you're exposed uh, and it takes about two to five days in general. This is what I'm seeing more, although they say up to 30 days, but usually it's you can now pinpoint the person and the place and the time when you really most likely got exposed and then infected. So it would take about uh, five days, let's say, two to five days for you to start feeling a little sick. So your ability to produce the antibodies will take 14 days and you have to include the time when you just got infected. So if you started feeling s symptoms in uh, day five, let's say, you have to add another five days to that time. And then you want to have a little bit overlap 
of the ivermectin with your body's immunity because when your body's immunity comes in you know the troops are being called in they're not standing in line already in in arrangement to fight the virus they're just kind of coming in haphazardly trying to catch those bad guys they're not yet in full-blown effect so you got to give it like three four days to kind of kick in so you want a little bit overlap so Usually I recommend seeing how things go based on blood work and, and symptoms, but minimum of 10 days. You kind of have at least a one day overlap, right? So imagine five days plus 10, 15. So uh, you do that for one day, you get 0.45 milligram per kilogram to review. And then the next nine days you do at 0.3 milligram per kilogram. What age to start? Well, as long as you are 15 kilograms or above, uh, it is safe to use the medication and you can look that up. I've used it uh, in uh, children as young as uh, six years old. Um, and I have to remember maybe even younger than that. But first graders, I've, I've used it for, for school. That's why I'm saying six years old. And it really depends on their, on their weight. And I've given them, uh, you know, two to four pills. So... The uh, question is why treat kids? Well, like I was, uh, unbeknownst to me, predicting in March uh, that there should be treated as one treats Kawasaki uh, syndrome. Indeed, um, two months later, even though I was laughed at and told it was unsafe to give immunoglobulins, in May, they reported uh, two cases where children died. They didn't have any symptoms. And it was six weeks after their exposure and uh, four kids, I believe, were uh, four or five. I can't remember the number exactly. I think it was four were saved uh, using exactly what I was saying, treating them like uh, Kawasaki like syndromes with aspirin and IV immunoglobulins safely. So it's important that you still are cautious, even with children, although it's very rare to be very vigilant with them as well and um, treat them now. Let's move from the prescription ivermectin to other things. What other things should you do? Well, there are uh, other things that help our immune system. And everybody has been talking about that. But there is also a little bit confusion as to the dosage and how much to take. When you take, it's very important because I've seen people make a mistake. You have to take it on an empty stomach. Okay, empty stomach with a glass of water because otherwise the absorption will be down and so you're really not going to get the dosage that you need to get. So that's another variable that you don't want to put into that equation. Uh, again, depending on the food that you eat, uh, you can use the Jewish rules about milk and meat to help you tell how soon uh, it's going to clear out of the stomach. So usually for, for meat, I would wait five hours. For, for dairy products, I would wait about two hours. All right. Let's move to the next phase. So the, the vitamins to use. So vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. You got to take it with a fatty meal. I would, especially in the Northern hemisphere where we're less exposed to the necessary UVB uh, light in order to generate our vitamin D naturally, we need to supplement our vitamin D. So take the first uh, those 50,000 international units, let me repeat that, 50,000 international unit. you take that as a loading dose and then you can go every single day after that, take 5,000 international units. You're not doing it for a long time. You're really not going to get side effects. Your natural vitamin D synthesis can never be over um, uh, uh, blown in terms of the amount that you're taking because the body can control but supplement yes you can overdose on them but again it will take a while for you to overdose and and you should be fine unless you are always taking the extra vitamin d and your vitamin d levels are as it is uh, elevated so um you take that on a daily basis next we're moving to vitamin c so vitamin c one of the problems with that is that you can have kidney stones when you take vitamin c so people with kidney stones please be careful I prefer chewable as to swallowing ones. Why? Because I believe that as it's uh, being chewed and absorbed in the throat in that medium, if there is some of the virus that is attacking the lining of the mucosal surfaces in the oral cavity and further down in the esophagus, you're able to locally battle it as well with a, a vitamin C antioxidant effect. 
So you, you take that 2000 milligrams per day uh, for adults, for children, you have to lower the dosage. I would, you know, again, depending on, on the person's age and stuff, probably about a thousand milligrams. Uh, again, remember, this is for a short while, so you're really not going to get any issues with it if you take it for two weeks or something like that. Drink a lot of water with that. Next thing is zinc. So there are different studies whether you use it in you know huge doses as was recommended with the Plaquenil, which is safe to take it for a short period of time. If you take it for over two weeks, you're going to reduce your body's ability to absorb copper and you can have some side effects from lack of copper absorption. So again, everything has to be uh, yin and yang, has to be in the right amount taken into your body understanding the whole picture of how it's working. I'm sorry, I'm not looking to the camera. I can't look at myself in the camera. So forgive me as I'm talking, I'm thinking about the process as if uh, we're talking one-to-one -one with the patient. So with, with the zinc for an adult, uh, 50, which is the recommended dose, uh, the studies that I've spoken about uh, for months uh, since April showed that it shortens any kind of flu. So zinc is good for any kind of flu. So 50 milligram per day, don't do the nasal uh, zinc sprays, you know, you kind of lose sense of smell from that and it doesn't really, um, to my knowledge, help. Uh, you can just take the oral zinc. So you take 50 for, for children, I would take 30 per day. If you end up taking some more, I, I personally don't think you need it when you have the entire package, but I don't believe if it's for a short time, it will really cause any uh, significant Problems, although some reports of, of when people take high doses have been reported with headaches and some other uh, symptoms. And again, it's hard to tell where is the headache from because with COVID, you also have headaches. We'll get to that point in a moment, uh, which in my opinion, uh, partly sometimes could be related due to the effect of the COVID on um, the vessels, blood vessels. And obviously it's related to the inflammation as well. There are a lot of factors that can be related there. So uh, we talked about the zinc. The next thing is the most dangerous thing that happens with the side effect of COVID is actually the clotting. So increase in your um, uh, blood viscosity that uh, can lead to a cascade that can lead to a clot that can then dislodge. And I've seen people who didn't listen to me, who taken less than the recommended dosage of the aspirin because they were concerned and end up having a TIA, a transit ischemic attack, which is a stroke. So you need to take the full dose of the uh, for the right person at 325. And we're going to discuss shortly at what is the right dose. There was a, a triad of one of the people I dedicated one of my runs to that I spoke about of things that increase the risk for clotting. So that's lack of mo mobility. And when you're sick, I tell people with COVID, especially get out of the bed, move around a little bit. Now, it's important to do that. If you're a little short of breath, take it a little bit easy. Don't push too hard, but you got to move around because if you're laying for a long time and you're susceptible, predisposed, so the older you are, if you're smoking, if you're a heavier weight, um, if you have some uh, problems with, with clotting uh, to begin with, uh, if you don't have your menstrual cycle for females, uh, if you have family history of heart attacks and all that kind of stuff, uh, you are, uh, as it is, at increased risk of getting a clot. So if you hear or remember those stories of pregnant women or non-pregnant women sitting on a long flight and not getting up and moving around and then dying when they uh, landed, that was from getting a clot in their lungs, pulmonary embolus, medically we call it. So, or if you already have some uh, problems with the carotid arteries being a little bit occluded, you have uh, one of those things shooting out and, and, and clogging it. The next issue that increased the risk besides not moving, which is why I recommend people move around, uh, is um, inflammation. Now, we know we have inflammation with COVID. So you have a second risk factor, that's uh, uh, inflammation. And then you have the trauma. And the trauma can be either physical trauma or it can be a trauma from the um, um, apoptosis, which is programmed cell death and, and, and the inflammation that results also causes trauma to the vessels, or it can be just because you have, as it is, you know, you, you like to eat your, uh, your meat with a little bit elevated cholesterol levels and you have cholesterol plaques in your vessels. So as it is, there is a little bit more of that friction in the vessels. So it doesn't go smoothly. And so the blood vessels, as they pop through them, they, uh, crack open, releasing their 
inflammatory mediators. Now, remember, it's released anyway just by COVID. And now you have on top of that the, the trauma. So you have everything you need, uh, literally, to compose a clot. And then you can have that clot lodge somewhere and cause problems. Like we have the COVID toes, even in young people, I've seen that. So that's when they become like sausages, painful. You really want to feel, you feel like you want to cut them off. I mean, it's really like crazy symptoms. So the thing that you have to be careful is when you do do blood thinners and the easiest one to give, uh, you know, uh, is, is aspirin. I think you can uh, get that. And, and I don't recommend the baby aspirin, but I recommend for adults and those at risk factors. I do recommend, uh, and you'll see the handout that I'll uh, include in this video below. I do recommend that you assess the person with the blood work where I look for uh, CRP uh, C-reactive proteins, and I look for PT, PTT, and INR. That's uh, how it is as it is. Your blood is thinned or not thinned. And the D-dimers, when they're elevated, that means that there is more uh, breakdown of uh, hemoglobin, red blood cells, forgive me. And that increases the, the uh, increase in coagulation and risk factors. So that's when you know that you need to give more uh, anticoagulation, something that will prevent the uh, clotting. So the aspirin should be taken with food, very important. And if you have um, reflux disease, we call it GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or if you have a history of duodenal also you have to be very, very careful with those things. So you don't want to, to open an ulcer and get into the hostel with, with that. So you want to make sure that you take antacid, uh, H2 blocker, the one that I recommend is um, Pepsid, 20 milligrams, and you take that um, anywhere from half an hour to an hour before you take the aspirin. But it's important that you don't take that before you take the other things because that will decrease the absorption of the other things that we mentioned. So you do all those things that we discussed, and then afterwards, right, you take the Pepsid, and then you take the, the um, aspirin. And you should take it every day. And the question is, how long do you take it? And people have sometimes said, oh, I feel fine, fine, fine. And then three weeks after, boom, they went into the hostel. Or four weeks afterward, they die on the street. Not to scare you, but it can happen. So that effect with the clotting, it may have generated the clot. It may be sitting out there somewhere in, in one of your vessels and just waiting for the time when you feel like, oh, I'm feeling better and start moving around and boom, it dislodges and, and shoots into your lungs or shoots into your brain and boom, you have issues. So it's important that you guys um, do it for long enough time and how long? Well, do the blood work. So see your physician and, and evaluate the things that I mentioned. I also do blood work for other things, including the white count, because if you have a lower white count, basically you have less of a standing army, you're not going to do so well, especially at the beginning of the disease, because that's what the innate, your standing army depends on. It's not yet producing the immunoglobulins. Remember, that's the T cell mediated immunity that comes later. Now, you're going to say, all right, that's, that's good. So all those things, some of them, I need a physician. What are the other things that I can do? Well, another thing that you can do, which is a pill, we're going to talk about some other homeopathic things that we can do, is called NMN. NMN um, is a nicotinamide mononucleotide, and that is... Uh, you can consider that as an energy booster to your body. So if your body is unable to produce the oxygen because the cells that produce the oxygen are infected and destroyed by the virus, some of them in your lungs, you're able to give the, the byproduct of that oxygen generation, which is used by the mitochondria, the battery in your body in order to produce energy, you can get already that energy that the mitochondria usually produces, you can get it through the NMN. How much do I recommend to take? Well, on a regular day, you can take a thousand. When you're sick, I would recommend 2000. So you take 1000 in the morning milligrams and 1000 in the evening milligrams. There are different companies you can look for. A lot of them are good and you can find it on Amazon for a variety of, of prices. I usually come, I, I prefer the ones in, with 500 milligrams. So this way I just take two pills and then I take in the evening two pills. Um, the next thing to do is in your home or your office where you are, increase the humidity to about 55%. This 
helps reduce the virus ability to hang in the air. So instead of hanging there for over two hours, which it will do when there is less humidity, it will hang there for less time. By the way, regular sunlight doesn't, doesn't destroy it. You need UVC, we'll get to that in a moment. The other thing that you need to do is you can have air purifiers. Now, when you get those air purifiers, you have to check how big an area they can clear, number one. Number two, um, at what regiment you need to put, because sometimes you need to raise it, which makes a lot of noise and you're like, oh, I can't have it. And they also blow air in the process. So you need to take that into account because those air currents can also push the, the virus in. So you want first to ha increase the humidity in the air. And after you do that, then you put in that uh, air purifier system in. And it has to work for at least um, uh, 0.3 microns size. Because if it's, if it's more than that, um, you know, the virus will escape the filters and will simply be circulating even more. So I've seen people getting sick from going into a huge place uh, and um, one or two people sick and the air system just took it and circulated it throughout the place and people were sick in here and like far away in another complete location because the air vents took it out and brought it um, present of the ducts to the other people and even some who uh, we're wearing masks, got it. So the question is, was it from surfaces? You know, we, when we wear the mask, there were plenty of studies done. We do touch our eyes, you know, I have glasses, but even still you scratch underneath the eyes. You move the mask down. Some people move it off and only cover their mouth, not their noses. I mean, you know the story. It, it goes different places. Scratch the corners of the mouth. We've all been guilty of that, physicians as well, nurses, everybody. So um, if you think that you're going to be able to remember to avoid that, you're not. The next thing to do is to make sure that you, and I'm going to say something a little controversial, is that you get out of the house. Now you're going to say, oh gosh, he's sick with COVID. You're telling him to get out of the house. You want other people to get sick. I mean, are you crazy? <sighs> there are many people sick that don't even know it. And they're walking outside. And that's how you got it. We all have to use our protection when we're outside. If you know that you're sick, Wear a mask when you're outside, especially when you're coming within, I would say, 12 feet to someone. Okay, and don't get close to someone. Don't hug them, kiss them or whatever. Stay, stay away from them, all right? Other things to do is to, and don't laugh, is actually just like you wash your hands when you touch dirty things to also wash your nose. How do I recommend do that? You take a little soap on your pinkies, one pinky over here in one nostril, one pinky in the other nostril, rub it around and then blow water take water in in your hand cup it and blow a little bubbles in it and then use a vacuum so the way you do it is you put your nose in and open them up after you already pushed all the air out and that vacuum causes it to draw in a little bit it's easier when you're in the shower and you do that because then your gravity also helps along and then obviously speed that water do it three times now after you wash your nose very important moisturize it because if you don't moisturize it you'll have crack in your lining and then that those cracks will end up giving an entry point to any viruses or bacteria. Now, some people who already were sick will say that they don't need to wear a mask because they have antibodies. They are wrong. Uh, just like if you touch something, you can pass it to someone else, even if you don't get infected yourself, so too their nasal passages can be carriers. Now, the reason they can be carriers in the nasal passages is because well, one of the main reasons is because while you're producing antibodies, the antibodies you're producing are IgM and IgG. They are protecting your blood, um, inner organs. They do not protect your mucosal surfaces such as the nasal and oral passages or the uh, intestinal tract. So it's important that you actually wash the areas that can expose others as well or wear a mask. You know, if you're if you're sick, definitely wash it. If you think you're exposed to someone, definitely wash it, because you even if the, it's already entered, you're going to reduce the amount of the viral load that you have, allowing your body a longer period of time to develop the immune system, and that's probably one of the reasons why some people take a little longer before they get sick than other people. Um, not all. There are a lot of factors like a jigsaw puzzle in it related to your genes and other and other factors. Now, some people say that they have the genes that prevent them from getting the disease. So you may not get sick. Okay. 
Uh, I do believe in that, just like there are rare cases of people who get uh, HIV but don't get AIDS. So they get infected with the virus, but the virus doesn't affect them in a way that it affects other people. So too, I do believe there are a group of select people who, who the virus, specifically the COVID virus, and that doesn't mean that all viruses, just the COVID virus is unable to penetrate their system. That's called natural selection if we didn't use treatment and, and, and vaccines. But uh, it's, it's important that they still follow uh, hygienic rules, wear masks, uh, wash uh, surfaces, because even if they are not thinking about them, the, in, infecting themselves, they can still be carriers and in, cause the infection to others. So um, that's something that I that I recommend. And I know it sounds funny, but yes, you do. Um, you could benefit from, from cleaning your nose as well. Uh, another thing that you can do in your house and business, and I've done it in my business and it's been working amazingly well for me, that's the best um, lab test for that, is using UVC. So the only wavelength, there are three wavelengths to ultraviolet light, UVA, UVB, UVC. The only wavelength that can destroy the uh, viruses and bacteria, there's a few extremophiles, they're called, that can survive that. But COVID luckily is not in that group. And uh, UVC, which ranges from 200 to 290 nanometer wavelength, uh, and specifically around the 250s is, is what was is being used has shown to be very effective to kill the virus, but it is dangerous. You can get skin cancer, you can get um, uh, cataracts, you know, you can get uh, uh, a lot of damage. And we've experimented with that when I was working in the lab with ultraviolet light and how it affects on skin cancer. UVC, we know, causes it. So you got to use it in a manner where you're not exposed to it when you're there. And also it has a small range. It actually doesn't penetrate through the ozone layers. It doesn't reach us and it does not extend very far from where you do it, depending on the power of the light that you use. So the way to use it is you bring the air in and you clean it with UVC and then the clean air you uh, let out. And so that's what we did in our office. We've invested a huge amount of money in March and uh, we already had vents to remove some of the uh, plume that occurs from when we uh, do surgery from electrocautery. And what we did do is we added UVC in all the air ducts. So the air is being pulled in with the um, suction is being uh, using it with the vents. Then it's cleaned in the ducts with UVC and then positive air pressure pushes the clean air into the room. And so even though we've had people who were sick from the outside, uh, nurses, uh, medical assistants, front desk, when they came in, they were not infecting anyone else, even though they were sitting less than six feet apart. And trust me, that's not because they were wearing the masks or they cleaned everything afterwards. No, it's because of the UVC. And the example is in our lunchroom, we were all sitting together eating over there and nobody, and we tested ourselves again, and again, and again, nobody got sick from one another. And the reason was because of this system is constantly working and to keep it on all the time is not that expensive. So you need to do that. So uh, that's about the UVC. Now for a house, you don't need to get this kind of expensive stuff. What you can do is there is a, a person who I know who uh, does excellent work with that. And his uh, company is called uh, Virus Stop Technology. Um, I think it's uh, virusstoptech.com. Yes, I just looked up the website for him. And you can order stuff for the house or for the office. We have some of his uh, things also in our office as well. And they've been very effective and quiet and safe. So absolutely do not worry everything. And I checked the insulation. I bought a specific, specific UVC monitor. So I went around all the machine to check how much UVC is emitted and no UVC is emitted at all. So, you know, and, and uh, he's someone who I completely trust and you can connect with him if you want to, or send us uh, a question and you know, if you can find him. He is indeed very busy right now because a lot of people are asking for the units, but uh, he's uh, supervising himself the um, building of those units and he does not let any of them out before he checks out everything. A very honest guy, which is uh, unusual just in general, not only in that field. 
the next thing is uh, the vaccine. Please, what's up? Don't worry, get the vaccine now. Anywhere is okay. <laughs> And it was not painful at all. Not at, at all. all, right? So easy. Yes, when, when a professional does it. Thank you so much. She has a soft hand. She's very good. I am, I am. Really. No reason not to do it. Thank you. You're going to say which vaccine to get? Um, get the AstraZeneca, 70%. Get, get the Pfizer, get the um, Moderna. You know, they're all good. Um, whatever you can get you get uh you want to wear it for the you know johnson johnson vaccine whatever you want to do but but getting the vaccine definitely if you have an opportunity to do that you should do that unless you have some conditions that you may be allergic to and usually what they do is they give you the vaccine they watch you for like 15 minutes or so make sure that you don't have any untoward uh, allergic reaction and then you're you're free uh, so those vaccines are definitely tested and are safe. And I uh, take off my hat for those who in such a short period of time were able to do that. You guys are brilliant geniuses and uh, the world is in gratitude uh, to you and to everything that you do. Let's see, is there anything else? Uh, I guess you'll see it, the rest on the list of things that I will post um, so you can read. And if you have questions, call and please um don't start late the earlier you start the treatment the better it is use the right dosage uh be conscientious uh towards others you know don't uh, you know be cavalier or callous it's not only your life but it's the life of others that are perhaps more susceptible than you okay and i've seen people in their 20s who died be serious, take it seriously, and treat in time. And if the oxygen goes down, uh, don't wait. You need to get um, oxygen supplementation, go to the hospital. Yes, there was something. I knew there was something I forgot. The anti-inflammatory, to help the cytokine storm, one of the things that I've used since the beginning of the COVID pandemic was Zelgens, and I know it's not approved for that, but I've used it for so many people. Everybody was safe, nobody had any side effects. Use it in time, use it early, works very, very well. I use Zelgens, and dosage depends, but usually I use uh, 10 milligram twice a day for, for a few days, maximum uh, 10 days, and they feel very well. If they don't, there's something else going on. So check out whether there's bacterial pneumonia. And sometimes you get, as I described before, the double or triple hit. So you get the virus, then you can get the bacterial pneumonia as well. Antibiotics use is really not necessary. There's no need to kill your, your good gut flora just because you're treating a virus because it doesn't kill the virus. Um, it will predispose you to other possible infections and its effect as an anti-inflammatory is not that good. So if you want something anti-inflammatory, use stuff that really works for anti-inflammatory. When you play tennis, do you play with a bat or with a tennis racket? Yeah, you can hit the ball with a, with a bat, you know, but that's not the best way to play a tennis racket. I mean, if you're Bruce Lee, yeah, you can use your nunchucks to play ping pong, but don't you prefer for most people to use a ping pong racket? So don't, don't use an antibiotic for, for that purpose. Use either the Zelgens, which I recommend. Unfortunately, it's a little expensive, uh, also done by Pfizer. Or use uh, prednisone, which is very cheap and very easily available. The other thing I'm seeing is the dosages are not given, in my opinion, correctly. And as dermatologists, we use uh, higher short-term short doses to bring down the inflammation. Just when you do do the prednisone, be careful. Make sure that you also don't get a secondary bacterial infection because you're a little bit uh, immunosuppressed. Now, if you're worried and you have diabetes, you don't want to increase your sugar level, definitely use the Zelgens. There is no concern with that. I've used it uh, safely in them without increase in their uh, sugar levels. You do need to watch for liver. And again, speak with your physician. If you're not sure, if you need our help, we're here to help you. I don't need the business, but I do need to make sure that as many people as possible are healthy and are using the right treatment dosage and are not dying from this easily preventable uh, disease and are not um, losing uh, quality of life. Thank you. Stay safe, healthy, 
and happy new year to you and your entire family.